Yeah. Hello, I'm starting now. Oh, huh? Okay. Okay, we are just about to start. Okay, I think it's time. Um, are there any questions uh, before we get started? Anybody, any questions? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, very good. Yeah, thank you. Um, if no question, uh, we can get started, I suppose. The last time we were talking about constitutive relations, and then we look at the constitutive relations of some material like polar, uh, polarization density and how that affects uh, constitutive relation. And then we went to the conductive medium case. Okay, we have P equal to epsilon naught chi E and then D is equal to epsilon naught one plus chi E. And then we have um, this kind of thing. And then we know how to find epsilon effective. And this is just essentially just one plus that, okay? So, and then we went to the case where we have uh, uh, Ampere's law, where we have J plus partial D partial T. And then we have J equal to sigma E for conductive media. Okay, and then the other one is just J omega E. Okay, 
So this is a conductive medium case. And then we say we can combine the two. Oh, sorry, there should be an epsilon here. Okay. We can combine the two and write it as j omega epsilon minus j sigma over omega d. So when you multiply this in, you get back the previous equation. This we call a complex permittivity. And Ampere's law becomes just of the same as before, except that a real permittivity now is being replaced with a complex permittivity. And we can solve these equations the same because the algebra or complex numbers are the same as the algebra for real numbers. They are not very, very different. Okay, so we're going to introduce more kinds of media where we can have effective uh, permittivity coming from different uh, kinds of physics. And before I do that, I like to uh, revise the Lorentz force law. Lorentz force law is the charge of a particle times the electric field plus the charge of the particle particle times V cross B. Okay, this is called the V cross B force. Okay, V cross B force. This is just Coulomb's law. Okay. Um, and we're going to some uh, we're going to derive some effective permittivity using Lorentz force law later in the course. But before we do that, uh, let's look at um, the Lorentz summer field model. Uh, let's go back to the case where we have the electric flux. Uh, I hear some echo. I guess. Uh, Okay, and then uh, we're going to find a rather different ways of finding P. And this P that we're going to find is for plasma medium. Or just plasma. And plasma happens when the electron, you have a nucleus, you have an electron. And if the electron gets broken away from the nucleus and they're free to roam. That ha happens in the ionosphere. Okay, in the ionosphere, the air is so rarefied that the electron is not bound to the nucleus anymore. So the electrons are free to roam. They are very free to roam, they're not bound. And they become like very much like free electron. Okay, so in the plasma medium, you can think of a medium having a lot of electrons that are very free to, to roam. But the nucleus are bulky. Nucleus are many, many times heavier. So when you apply an electric field E, okay, the electric field E would apply a force to the electron that are free to roam. Okay, these are free electrons. And they respond very rapidly to the applied field, but the nucleus, okay, the positive ion of the nucleus, they are very heavy. And when they apply an electric field, they are they're sluggish. They're very sluggish and they don't move about. So we just look at how the electron move about when we apply an ele uh, electric field. So we apply Newton's first law, which says that uh, force equals mass times acceleration. And so if the electron is accelerating, then the force that you need to exert on the electron is proportional to its acceleration. 
Okay, let's assume that uh, you have uh, this picture over here. Okay, this picture over here, where the electron is free to roam, but the nucleus is very heavy. And we uh, call the distance of the electron from the nucleus to be x. And we can focus on this picture. And when the electric field is applied, then the force on the electron will be given by minus QE. Okay, minus QE. So the force on the electron is, is mass times its acceleration, and the applied force is given to be uh, minus E. Okay, force is QE, is minus e, e because in this problem, Q is minus E. The electron has a negative charge. Okay, and we have this equation to solve. How can we solve this equation? Well, we have an equation that looks like this. And let's assume that uh, the motion of the electron is sinusoidal. The electric field is sinusoidal or time harmonic. Okay, this is time harmonic. Sometimes we call it CW, sometimes we call it sinusoidal. Uh, I didn't spell sinusoid correctly, so I should say sinusoidal. And another name for it is actually uh, monochromatic. In optics, they were called monochromatic. They all mean the same thing, depending on which en engineer do you talk to. Uh, so we solve this problem in the frequency domain or use. <laughs> Uh, any question? No. So if we assume that the field is time harmonic, okay, that E is proportional to this, and then X would also be proportional to this, all of them will be in time harmonic motion, then the square X, the T square, okay, would be minus J omega square X Okay, if X is something of this form, and then it would be just um, plus omega square X. Okay, if you square that J square, it's minus one. And then that equations of motion from Newton's law just becomes minus ME omega square X is equal to E, but Please bear in mind that we are now in the phasal world. Okay, we're okay, in the phasal world. Uh, I think one of you has to switch up your mic because I'm hearing an echo. I'm hearing the echo. Okay, I, I'll switch off Sally's mic, okay? Maybe it's coming from you, I don't know. Okay. So, this is using what we call phaser technique, or frequency domain technique. Uh, we assume that everything is sinusoidal. And these are now actually supposedly complex numbers, but we usually don't denote them. Uh, it's understood, okay? Then you can solve for the X phasor will be given by E over ME omega square uh, times E. Okay, so this electron now is polarized. It is at the distance x from the nucleus, and then the polarization density of the dipole moment is minus Ex. This is the dipole moment. Okay, so this would make a dipole with the dipole moment. And the dipole moment is given by the charge times 
x, and since the charge is negative, the dipole moment will be negative. That is, if you have, if you apply an electric field in this direction, okay, so if you apply an electric field in this direction, the nucleus is here, then the electron will tend to move in this direction. That's what it means. Electron will tend to move in this direction because the field of the electric force is negative to its sign. So it creates a negative dipole moment. That's why uh, it looks like that. And then um, if we calculate this dipole moment now, it's actually minus E square uh, M E omega square E. Okay, that is the case of a one dipole. But if you have many, many of dipoles, you get the dipole density. Then the polarize the dipole or polarization density is n times the dipole moment of a small dipole. This is called the polarization density. And this is the dipole density or electron density. It could be just because for every electron, there is a dipole. So this N can be thought of as electron density. Because of that, then capital P will be just N times a little p, which should be just N times E square omega square M sub E E. Okay. So the polarization density P for this special medium is just the negative of the applied electric field. Because it's negative for a very simple reason is because the components that contributes to the dipole is actually its electron moving around. So if you apply an electric field, the electron goes in this direction. It contributes to a negative dipole moment. And finally, it contributes to a negative dipole density. Okay. Any questions so far? Well, everything looks good. And, and then we are ready to apply this to look for an effective permittivity. I have a question, Professor. Oh, sure, sure. Yes, what yeah. is your question? Here we consider uh, the ionosphere where, where we have uh, those ions plus and minus. Mm -hmm. uh, like electron and uh, nuclear. Yes. Uh, is this uh, is this okay if we consider them dipoles? Because once we apply the electric field, they uh, they become accelerating in uh, opposite directions. And uh, well, basically, what's the what's the um, condition under which we can consider them dipole? Because they uh, uh, are split quickly. Uh, actually, they are dipoles, only that the nucleus does not move, only the electron moves. So if you apply an oscillating time harmonic electric field, only the electron will move back and forth sinusoidally. The nucleus, we can assume that it has zero motion. It's just very heavy. Okay. Oh, I see. So the, the thing that contributes to the dipole moment is the electron moving around. So this dipole moment is negative, and then the dipole density is also negative because of that reason. And, and then now we, we are ready to plug in and find out what happens that uh, if you go to this slide and say that D is actually the vacuum part plus P, and P we just have figure out what it should be. It should be uh, minus n e, uh, sorry, not n e, n square over omega square m e e. Okay, it has two terms. The second term is coming from p that we have just uh, learned in the previous slide here. And let me make it bigger, maybe it would be easier to see. Okay, you can see that p is something of that form. And I should have uh, e square here, sorry. E square here. And then I can rewrite this as um, 
epsilon naught 1 minus n square e square uh, over epsilon naught m e times 1 over omega square e. I just rewriting terms in the fashion that I separate out the omega square and I will call this omega p square. I just define this big constant by a new name and then I will have this 1 minus omega p square over omega square e. So this is essentially that and then this is a new effective permittivity. The effective permittivity is now epsilon naught 1 minus omega p square over omega square. This is a very interesting permittivity because it can become negative. Uh, if omega is less than omega p, epsilon is negative. Okay, can you see that? When, so, uh, when omega is less than omega p, this thing is larger than 1. Okay, this term is larger than 1 and epsilon will become negative. What happens if epsilon becomes negative? We learned that, uh, let's see, let's go something. Okay, we learned that uh, the solution to the wave equation does not change. We still have uh, whatever we had before, we have the wave equation uh, that we have derived. We see Laplace in E uh, plus omega squared mu epsilon E is equal to zero. The only thing that we need to change is this epsilon here. For a constant frequency, it's still a real number. And this solution would have the wave that propagates in this manner, plus a minus e to the minus j k z. Okay, doesn't matter. And do you know, do you remember what k is and what k should be if you were to solve this equation for a 1D problem? This is for 1D. Okay. In 1D, you assume that Laplacian square is partial square, partial z square, and that the e is only a function of z. e is a function of z only. So I should have the x here. I should, by right, saying that this is x polarized. And do you remember what k should be if I were to solve this equation? Does anybody remember what k should be? If I were to solve this equation, convert into 1D. Let me write the 1D version over here. So if I plug this back here, I get this 1D equation. And I claim, I'm claiming that the 1D equation has solutions that looks like this. I'm just asking you what K should be in this case. Uh, should it satisfy dispersion relation? That's true. K satisfies dispersion relations. But it's even simpler than that. We went through the 1D wave equation. And you actually uh, going ahead and skipping ahead and telling me something about the 3D wave equation. I'm not even doing something that complicated. I'm just doing 1D wave equation and ask you what K should be. Uh, it's on go over C0. Uh, on Very good. Over C naught squared. Okay, essentially it's equal to that. K squared is equal to that, and K is omega over C, uh, where C is 1 over square root of mu epsilon. Okay? Okay, another way of saying this K is omega square root of mu epsilon. K that we have now is omega square root of mu epsilon. It's not writing out well. Okay, it writes now. So K is equal to omega mu epsilon. And what would happen if epsilon becomes a negative number? All the algebras that we have done before still holds true for this medium. Except that this epsilon can be a negative number. What happens to K when epsilon becomes negative, like in this case over here? Uh, it becomes a complex number. Uh, it becomes a very simple kind of complex number. Uh, what is that kind of complex number? 
it becomes pure imaginary, right? If you were to take the square root of a negative number, it becomes a pure imaginary number. Pure imaginary number. Did you get that? K becomes a pure imaginary number. Can everybody get that? Okay, so if k becomes a pure imaginary number, what happens to this wave? If k is a pure imaginary number, instead of them oscillating, remember when we do this, we have to go back and forth between frequency domain and time domain. So you will have to multiply this by e to the j omega t. Uh, let me see. So in order to go back and forth between uh, frequency domain and time domain, say if Ex is E0, E to the JKZ, uh, then essentially if we go back to the time domain, uh, Zt, you will have to multiply this by E to the J omega T. Let me put a minus sign here so that it, it has the right wave, okay? And then I will have to take the real part of this. This formula you have to remember over and over again. This is the bridge between frequency domain and time domain. This is frequency domain. This is time domain. Okay. And E naught can be a complex number with a phase. Okay, E naught can be a complex number and the most general way to express the complex number is that it has a phase. So if you take this now, it will become cosine of omega t minus kz uh, plus alpha, okay? So that's how you should go back and forth. But what happens if k is a pure imaginary number? Then ex is just equal to e naught e to the minus, say, say k is, um, uh, minus j beta, uh, beta might not be a good number, but j gamma, okay? It becomes pure imaginary. Then minus j times minus c. So this becomes just that. And it becomes decaying. And if you go back to the time domain, it's still a decaying signal, which means that the plane wave cannot propagate in such a medium. Such a wave is called an evanescent wave. And this in fact happens in the plasma. That is, if you were to look at the ionosphere, which is above our head out in the sky, and if the radio wave that you're trying to propagate, the frequency is too low. If the radio wave that you're operating, your ham radio wave, has too low a frequency, it will see an ionosphere that has a negative permittivity. That radio wave cannot penetrate in through the ionosphere. It will bounce back and that's what <coughs> Marconi had. <coughs> it was really lucky. He lucked out in the sense that he did his experiment not knowing that there was an ionosphere out there and the radio wave that he sent from one part of the earth from I guess was England to Canada. Okay, right the other way was able to bounce back and forth from the ionosphere and reach, uh, I think it's Newfoundland somewhere in Canada, uh, Cornwall, England to Newfoundland, Canada. And if the ionosphere had not been there, this, this ionosphere link layer is also called the heavy side layer. Okay. Uh, his experiment would not have been successful and he will not be funded to do more experiments. We are very lucky that his experiment was successful. He received more funding and then he get to do more experiments and we develop the technology of wireless communication that we have today. Any questions so far? Well, we can generalize this concept to the case where the electron now is bound to the nucleus by some kind of a force, 
okay, some kind of a force. Um, we don't care, we, we know that such a force is there. The electron is not always free to roam, especially electrons that are in an atom or a molecule, they're actually bound to the thing. And we can model such an atom with a spring in this manner. Very simple-minded model, but it captures the physics well enough, okay? So if we were to write Newton's law again uh, for this problem that we have now, Newton's law would say that uh, according to Hooke's law, we have to add one more term. This, the first term is called inertial force. This is due to Newton's law, acceleration needs force. And then there's a Hooke's law, and Hooke's law is something like this. The, the force that you need to pull a electron from the nucleus is like a spring force. And then the applied force is EE, okay? So you can modify this equation and then solve it again uh, using phasor technique. I wouldn't go through the same technique again, but essentially you will get an X with something like EE over uh, omega squared me minus kappa. Okay, you will get such a thing. You can plug in your phasor technique and they can rewrite this as uh, EE over omega squared minus omega naught squared. I just bring everything out, bring the me out and then omega naught squared is just equal to kappa over me. Can you see that? Okay, if you can not see the mathematics, that's fine. I'm just doing the mathematics a bit fast, okay? So then you can plug in and then you can have a dipole moment and then you can get your little p is equal to minus ex and then you get the polarization density with the n ex uh, and you get this to be uh, capital P is equal to np where N is the density of the atom. And you can generalize this model even further by assuming that there's some kind of a dissipation. And if there's a dissipation, then you can say that there's an inertial force term. And then there's a friction force term. And you probably learned from high school that frictional forces are proportional to the velocity of the moving body. So we say that this force is proportional to the velocity of the moving body. The xdt is just velocity, it is acceleration. This term is frictional force. Okay. And, and then uh, frictional force can come about many ways due to rubbing of two bodies. It could be due to collisions of two bodies and so on. And if you solve this problem using the same technique as we had before, okay, you will get an equation that looks something like this, very similar. But since this is the first derivative in time, you will get the j omega, and then you will have something that looks like this, okay? And then you will have a omega naught square. Omega naught square is just this spring constant term uh, times the mass of the electron times e, okay? So any questions so far? You see how powerful phasor technique is? Phasor technique allows us to analyze a plasma medium. Phasor technique allows us to analyze the case of the electron bound to the nucleus by a spring. And then we can introduce a frictional force term, which is this term over here, and apply phasor technique and solve the same uh, P again, and we get P to be that. And then after obtaining P, then you can get your uh, P is epsilon naught E plus P, okay? And you can plug in and get your effective uh, 
E, and those have been written up in the lecture notes. And you will see how wonderful this analysis is. Any questions so far regarding this technique? So this final expression of P is basically the sum of all the all the approximations you've done ahead from including how the electron axis create dipole moments and then add the frictional force. So you can divide them all separately using phasor technique and then add them together in the end. Yeah, you can convert this into phasors, okay? The, you have to go through the thought processes of phasors, assuming that this electric field is time harmonic, okay? Because the electric field is time harmonic and this system is linear, very important. If the input, this is the input, this is like the driving force. This is the input to the system. If the system is linear and the response or the output is your X, Okay, you probably have learned about input and output in your uh, linear response theory in electrical engineering. And you will see that problems of this kind are amenable to phasor technique. And when you did your undergraduate courses, you remember that you have a second order ODEs involving inductors and capacitors. And in order to solve those ODEs, you use phasor technique and convert them into, like in this case, uh, a very simple algebraic equation. Uh, we show that, uh, uh, let me see, over here, uh, just for example, if you were to look at this again, we have, a, we have an ODE, a second order ODE, using phasor technique, we convert into an algebraic equation and then you can just relate these two free phasors. Uh, you do the same thing for the case when you have a restoring force, when you have a spring, you convert this into a phasor. And in phasor technique, you just replace partial square, partial T square with minus omega square. And then you solve this equation as an algebraic equation, you get this. And then you can do the same, uh, where did this come from? Uh, I don't know where this comes from, though. It's strange. I think I can delete it, right? Yeah, I don't know where it came from, but uh, then you can go to the even more complicated case where you add an additional term on the left-hand side of that equation. It becomes the second order ODE with three terms. Again, you can convert this into an algebraic equation using phasor technique and relate your x to your e. And then after that, you relate your, your p to your e and get this effective permittivity. So yeah, very good question. Any, any other questions that you might have? The wonderful thing about this equation is that uh, it's actually quite powerful. It actually is an equation that describes all kinds of media. Okay. Uh, even when you have uh, an electron moving in a conductor, you can very much use this model as well. We have assumed that the electron is coming from a plasma medium. However, if you have a conductive medium, you will have electrons moving in a sea of electrons like uh, conductive metal. Okay, you can think of this electron moving about very freely too. Okay, and those electrons uh, are known to have an effective mass. You can actually prove that by doing quantum theory, show that the electrons that move about in a conductive material like a semiconductor material uh, they are very much like electrons in a plasma, except that, um, except that the electrons seem to have an effective mass that is different from its free electron mass. And this is a table that shows that sometimes the electron uh, effective mass becomes smaller, sometimes it becomes 
larger depending on what kind of uh, material you are in. Okay, so electrons moving about in a crystal lattice is very much similar to an electron moving about in a plasma. Okay, so when the frequency is very high, this term dominates. When is frequency high? Frequency is high means that the inertial force term is large. Okay, so when the inertial force term is large, and then the frictional force term is small, and the restoring force term is small. This equation looks like that of a plasma again. Can everybody agree on that? that if I can drop this term, I can drop this term. Can you see my cursor? Can you all see my cursor? Yes, yes I can yes. see your cursor. Okay, good. So you can drop this term and that term. Then we are back to the plasma equation again. And if you can drop this term and that term, we get thing to back to the plasma equation. But what is so special about the plasma? Plasma is special in the sense that the permittivity can become negative. Okay, so when you have a sea of electrons, like in the case of a metallic medium, the permittivity of that medium can become negative. Okay, it can become negative. And, and what happens is that uh, when the permittivity becomes negative, you can have a kind of resonance behavior where all the particles would behave like, um, like a resonating particle. And because of that, then the particles can glisten or glow very brightly because of that. I write this up in greater detail in the lecture notes and also maybe in one of your homework that if you have a gold particle, you can have a very high dipole moment when you hit the resonance frequency of this uh, particle, you know, plasma frequency in it. And then you can have uh, a very bright reflection coming from these particles in this, what the Romans did when they actually figure out how to put gold particle inside lacquer to get them to glisten uh, uh, under light of a different illumination angle. Okay, any questions so far? I, I wrote this up in greater detail in the lecture notes, but the physics is very similar, okay? Any questions so far? If not, then, then let's move on to a interesting topic, which is the case of a gyrotropic medium. Okay, gyrotropic medium is interesting in the sense that uh, the wave will rotate as it propagates. We know about plane wave. We show that if we have a wave, okay, this wave essentially just becomes polarized in the x direction, electric field E polarized in the x direction, and then it will propagate in the Z direction in this manner. Okay, this is my Z direction. And the polarization does not rotate. Essentially, the electric field remains polarized in the X direction as it propagates. In a gyrotropic medium, what happens is that uh, if I were to draw a picture of this guy, uh, this thing rotates as it propagates in a gyrotropic medium. Okay, this is called the Faraday rotation. Okay, so in order to understand that, um, we have to do some math. Okay, um, and you will show that the epsilon for you will have the case where d is equal to epsilon e, and we have figured out how to derive this epsilon effectively. But for a gyrotropic medium, this would have to be a tensor, and we would figure out how to derive this tensor. Okay, so, well, how do we do that? We have to use more sophisticated law, okay? We have to use Lorentz force law that we never quite used fully last time, 
Okay, this is Lorentz force law. Uh, the V cross V force is very interesting because the first term is Coulomb's law. It says that if you have a charge, if you have apply an electric field, the charge just move in the direction, the force is in that direction, okay? This second term has very interesting meaning because if you have a charge moving with the velocity V, and if the B field is pointing upward, then the V cross B force uh, will be pointing outward, okay? The force is pointing out of the paper, okay? Can you see that? So particles moving across a magnetic field would be tending to be diverted to move in a circle. So you can think of this force as been coming out of the paper. And if I look in this direction, okay, you will see that the particles tend to gyrate. Okay, the particle actually gyrates. Okay, can you see that? The particle goes around in a circle in the magnetic field. And, and it's not easy to see it right now, but let's go through the map. So if we put in Newton's law on the left-hand side, then we mass times acceleration. Mass times acceleration, we can write as velocity. Okay. And then we can write that for a negative electric charge. And then negative electric charge for the second term as well. And we keep everything as being uh, with velocity because we want to work with velocity, okay? So let's assume that the problem is simple so that the B field is the static magnetic field pointing in the Z direction, okay? The B field is very simple. And if you have such a medium where the B field is pointing in the Z direction, this actually happens in the ionosphere. field. If you have the earth magnetic field, uh, let me draw here so as to not use too much space. The earth magnetic field goes around uh, like this because the B earth, okay? So there would be actually quite a bit of earth magnetic field around. And this earth magnetic field actually translate or transform the ionosphere medium into a gyrotropic medium. Okay, and let's see how that happens. So from, for simplicity, let's assume that the magnetic field is pointing in the Z direction, and let's see what happens to a medium with the Earth magnetic field pointing in the Z direction alone. Okay, so uh, in order to solve this problem, let's assume that uh, V has X component, and then a Y component, okay? And then you take uh, that law that you have, uh, we have written down, and then put them in the phasor wall. Okay, in the phasor wall, that law just becomes this law. Left-hand side is just, and let's assume that B is just ZB naught. And then you can do some algebra. Uh, you can do some algebra uh, and extract the X and Y component of this equation, which I'm not going to do because it's kind of laborious. Okay. Um, let's, let me assume one more thing, okay? Let me assume that uh, V is the R dt. Okay, where R is a position vector, it will be given by X, X plus Y, Y. Okay, so this position vector has two components. So, but in the frequency domain, this will be just J omega R. Would be J omega X, X plus Y hat, Y. So I will plug this into the right hand side as well. And then equate the X component and the Y component. And if I do that, then the equation that I have for the X component will look something like this. And then on the right hand side, I will have epsilon E naught 
ex sorry ex plus j omega b naught y okay it's just uh, uh, quite a bit of vector algebra uh, what i have done here is to assume that e has two components okay plug into that equation extract the x component the reason why i have omega squared is because there's one omega coming from here but v okay v is the r dt has another omega finally I have two omegas together making that omega square okay i wouldn't go to the detail but i'm sure that if you're at home you can do it yourself okay it's just a bit of tedious algebra but uh it's very safe you can do it at home yourself you know sometimes in tv they say don't try it yourself at home but this one i will give i will, I will condone the fact that you can do this at home without any risk okay you go through the algebra you get that um so you have two equations and two unknowns two unknowns the unknowns that you have are x and y okay, you know that you can solve them if you you have the grid you have enough grid you know how to slog through these two equations and solve for them but there's a clever way of solving this equation okay what you do then is actually to multiply the second equation with j and then add the two equations together okay and then do it with minus j and add them together and what you find is that uh, you get two equations that uh, say if you multiply just with j okay and you add these two equations together the left hand side would become that and then the right hand side would become e uh, ex plus j e y okay and then um, and then the other one if you multiply by j you will get uh, omega b naught multiplied by j you get actually j y okay plus um, let me see j j you get uh, two minus sign so you get actually uh, let me see j j j j y x plus j y this what i want to say okay i want to say i might have a sign error here but i'm not sure why where the sign error is coming from Okay, it's just multiply by j and add them. And then you can do the same and then multiply by minus j and add them. You get two equations that looks like this. Okay, you get two equations that looks like this. And now the great thing about this equation is that the unknowns, if I define my new unknowns to be this, s plus or minus and then uh, e plus or minus and then s plus or minus then these two equations are decoupled and they can be solved very easily okay you actually can write them as one equation if you want to uh, omega square s plus or minus equal to e uh, e plus or minus plus omega b naught s plus or minus okay so these equations are decoupled and you can solve them very easily and when you solve them um, the solutions are rather simple okay let me insert a new slide here Okay, you can solve them and then you can show that uh, 
s plus or minus equal to e okay m omega square minus or plus e b not omega e plus or minus let me see if you can see this okay take this equation assume that e plus is the input s plus is the output you move this output to the left hand side and then divide and then you solve this equation and that's what you get Okay, those are the two possible solutions. And we can say that this is like C plus or minus E plus or minus. Okay. And then uh, you can actually derive uh, dipole densities and you can also derive dipole density as we had before. Okay, again, you can see the little dipole is minus E X and so on. Uh, then you can go to the general case and show that B plus or minus is minus N E S plus or minus. Uh, that would be equal to minus N E. Uh, e is not the subscript, E is just an ordinary uh, function. And then if I plug this in, it would be C plus or minus E plus or minus. So you find a relationship between P and E, okay? P and E, and you can define a new chi in this manner. But this R, this are expressed in terms of this linear superposition. The P plus and minus are just this, uh, you know, uh, S plus and minus is this, E plus and minus is this. And at the same time, you can say uh, P plus and minus will be just PX plus or minus JPY, okay? So you can do this kind of thing. So you can uh, change coordinate system between what we call a rotating wave and a Cartesian coordinate. This actually is a kind of rotating wave as you will understand later. And then you can go back and forth between rotating wave and uh, Cartesian coordinate, okay? And then if you have this relationship, then what you have is that uh, you can also say that this kind of relationship can be written for, for that thing as well, and then you can have this thing as well, okay? You, in general, can write things in this manner. Uh, then you can go back and forth between different coordinate systems. These are in rotating wave coordinate system. I can also go back to Cartesian coordinate system. The algebra is kind of tedious, but what you have then is that if you go back to Cartesian coordinate, you will show that there is a Cartesian coordinate representation of this, and that chi will be given by half uh, chi plus plus chi minus. The chi are coming from here. You can read it out from that thing. And then you will have x plus minus x minus, and then minus j x plus minus x minus, and then you will have something like uh, x plus plus x minus, okay? So you have that chi, you can actually uh, work backward and deduce what your chi should be, okay? The lesson learned here is that in order to capture the physics of this problem, you actually have to turn chi into a tensor. And that's how a gyrotropic medium come about. Okay, another thing that you notice is that chi is Hermitian. Okay, so very complicated derivation. There are a few important concepts here, but what happens is that there is a relationship between P and E, but that relationship has to be a tensor or in terms of a two by two matrix, okay? So in general, then you can write D as being equal to epsilon E plus P. And then if you plug this in, you will get epsilon I plus chi dot E. And you have a way of working out the chi. Okay, the chi double bar is given to be that. 
Okay, any questions so far? I know the algebra is kind of long, but let me regurgitate it. So what we did was that uh, we start out with Lorentz force law. We have this very simple equation of motion. And then we assume that the B field is pointing in the Z direction. So as to simplify this equation. And then we assume that uh, B can be written in terms of X and Y component, but B is the R dt which is the time derivative for the X and Y coordinate system. And in the phasor world, uh, B and R are just related by J omega. So if you plug this equation back into these uh, equations that we have there, uh, if you were to equate the X and Y component of this equation, you get this equation. Okay, you get this equation, X and Y component. And then this equation is difficult to solve, okay? Because two equations, two unknowns, even though it's not tremendously difficult to solve, but you still have to do quite a bit of pencils and paperwork if you were to do uh, it at home. But then you can combine this equation in such a way that they become simplified. It becomes two decoupled equations. And when they become two decoupled equations, then you can solve them quite easily. Okay, without having to solve any matrix equation. And then you can find the relationship between S and your thing. S is just a rotating wave approximation of the, of the coordinates, okay? So if you have a way of de determining the dipole moment to be this and the dipole density to be that, then there's a rotating wave dipole density that you can write in this manner. And then you can also think that, well, I can always go be back and forth between the rotating wave uh, representation to the Cartesian coordinate representation because there is a connection between them. And that connection is rather simple. Uh, for, for the S, it's just that. For the E, it's just that. For the P, it's just that. Okay, you can go back and forth. And then you can work out the algebra that since there's a relationship with this rotating wave picture, I can also retrieve my relationship in the coordinate Cartesian space and then figure out what this chi is. And that chi turns out to be quite complicated. It's quite a bit of pencils and paperwork, but you can do it and it becomes just that. Any questions so far? Okay, no questions, very good. And this gives rise to what is called a Faraday rotation. Okay, this gives rise to what is called the Faraday rotation. But then, then let's move on to a new topic called wave polarization. Okay, wave polarization. And in order to understand Faraday rotation, uh, you have to understand what wave polarization is. Okay, so let's assume that uh, the electric field is not simple like what we did before, but instead of one polarization, it has two polarization. Okay, previously we just studied one of them. But let's assume that we have both X and Y polarization. But the wave is still moving in the Z direction. And then there's the X polarization. And then there's a uh, Y polarization that come out of the paper. Y is coming out of the paper. So there is an EX that points in that direction. And then there's an EY that points out of the paper. Okay. So the electric field is something like this. By the principle of linear superposition, uh, you can find the solutions because they show that the electric field satisfies this Helmholtz wave equation. So you can take the X component show that this is true and then you can take the y component and show that this is still true and then argue that each of them will be like that and then if you do the sinusoidal picture of what this should be you'll find that ex z of t if it's a sinusoidal plane wave or uniform plane wave will have something like e1 cosine of omega t minus 
uh, beta z. Okay, I'm using beta z. Sorry about that because I'm assuming that when you solve this equation, it will be something like this. Instead of using k and beta, k and beta are interchangeable in this course. Okay, you go to optics, you like to use k. You go to microwave, you like to use beta. Okay, I like you to treat of them, uh, think of them as being interchangeable. Okay, that is your wave number. And then I can do the same for EY. And EY is E2 cosine of omega t minus beta z. But not necessarily in phase with EX. Okay, there's an out of phase term. Okay, so then we can look at this wave as to what happens. Uh, we can study the case where alpha is pi over two. Okay, and then we look at this wave at z equal to zero. At z equal to zero, this wave will consist of two components, cos omega t plus y hat d2 cosine of omega t plus alpha, but alpha is pi over two. Okay, alpha is pi over two in this picture. And then we can track and study how the polarization of this wave would look like. Okay, let's do a simple thought experiment, very simple one. Okay, let me see if we can make things bigger. Any questions so far? If not, then let's look at this wave now. Let's look at this wave such that this wave is propagating in a z direction, both of them. And then x and y is that way, okay? And then z is coming out of the paper, okay? And we have two components, we have ex and ey. And at omega t equal to zero, what happens? If you look at these two waves, okay? Omega t equal to zero, this is one. Uh, what is the second term? Omega t is zero, it's cosine of 90 degrees is zero, right? So the wave is polarized completely in the x direction. So at t is equal to zero, uh, the wave points in the x direction, okay? t is equal to zero, agree? So you can go ahead and, and do more, okay? ex is equal to e1, and then EY is equal to zero for this case. And then you let time increase, omega T is equal to pi over four, four. So T has increased so much that this is true. Then you go back to this equation again. Now, so what happens when omega T is equal to pi over four? This is just one over root two. Cosine of pi over four is just one over root two. Cosine of 90 degrees plus pi over four is minus, uh, minus one over root two, okay? So you can work this out for this case, then EX is equal to E1 over root two, EY is equal to minus E2 over root two. Now what happens is that at T is equal to zero, that was what happens. Okay, Z is coming out of the blackboard and then this thing just points like this. Okay, this is the electric field now as a component in the x direction, but a component in the negative y direction. That is when t equals to well, omega t equals to pi over four, okay? So it actually moved from being horizontal to being something uh, but, uh, closer to vertical. And then if you keep tracking the polarization, when omega t equal to pi over two, you'll find that EX becomes zero again, and EY becomes minus EX, okay? You just go and track the equation, and that would look something like this, okay? And Z, and then it just points downward. This is an omega T equal to pi over two, okay? So you can see that this wave vector is rotating. It's rotating.
okay, it's rotating. And this is called a polarization of the wave that's rotating. It's called a left-hand elliptically polarized wave. Why left-hand elliptically polarized? The rule of thumb is this. You put your thumb, okay, rule of thumb and, and, and thumb, okay? Sounds like a pun to me. But you put your thumb in the direction of propagation of the wave. And then put your finger in the direction of rotation. I guess you cannot see, right? Can I make myself visible? See the stop share. So you, you put your thumb in the direction of propagation, right? Uh, and then you put your finger in the direction of rotation of the wave. And if it fits with your left hand, it's called a left hand uh, polarized wave, okay? And then uh, you do the same for other cases as well, okay? Let me see, I have a share screen again for this to Okay, so this is called a left hand elliptically polarized wave. Left hand. Uh, we don't see your screen, Professor. Oh, sorry. I have to share my screen again. Let me check. Um, yeah. But, um, My my thing is not among one of those, and I have to go in. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Okay. I did share screen. And then I share screen. Can you see my screen now? No. You not. Yeah. That's rather strange. Uh, how do I share it? Do you see anything of my screen at all? Or no sharing at all. No, it's not no. sharing at all. We yes. see. Your... We don't see anything. I click the share screen, nothing happens. Why, why doesn't it happen? Um, you see something? Yes, now it's back here. Okay, I'm sharing my whiteboard. I actually want to share my feed. Can you see my screen now? Uh, yes. Zoom whiteboard. You see the whiteboard? It's only the Zoom's whiteboard. Yeah, it, it, uh, it's still the Zoom whiteboard. I don't know why. Um, why is it still sharing the Zoom whiteboard? Um, Can you see? Okay. I don't know what is happening here. Uh, if I... Uh, it's your video again, Professor. It's my video again? Yeah, no PPT. No PPT. Um, still show sharing it, it, the what? It says that you're screen sharing, but nothing shows. 
Uh, then I don't know what the problem is. Let me try again. Okay, does it share now? Anything happens? It actually sat, oh yeah, it's back here. Now it's you, back? Yes. Oh, okay, okay. Thank goodness, I don't know why that happens. Uh, so this is called left hand elliptically polarization, okay? Or just LHDP. And then you can do other things with different phases. Alpha different will give you different kind of polarization. You can get right hand elliptically polarized. And also if you make um, E1 equal to E2, then you get circular polarization. Left hand circular polarized, right hand circular polarized. Okay, you get CP. CP implies circularly polarized wave. Okay. So you can see polarization by just changing the phase. Okay. And um, so there are very nice pictures in the lecture notes and in many textbooks. Okay. Okay, there are, there are many nice pictures. Uh, and you can, this is written up in a lecture note. It's just tracking how the things rotate. And so depending on the ratio of E1 and E2, okay, and depending on the phase angle between the two polarizations, you can get all manners of polarizations, elliptical, circular, on this diagram over here. You can study the lecture note for that. And this is actually something very complicated. It's written in, up in the lecture notes, but it's very complicated. I would suggest that you don't read it the first time around. Only if you have plenty of time, then you can go and read out the mathematics. Uh, this is actually something, some math on how, how this uh, ellipse are tilted. Sometimes they are tilted depending on the two amplitudes and the two phases, and you'll get, get different kinds of tilts. And the math is rather complicated. It can be worked out, but you don't have to know it by heart, okay? Then the last item I like to talk about is actually power flow. Okay, power flow. Uh, we know that in the phasor wall, then we have been talking about things in the time domain when we studied this concept uh, previously. In the phasor wall, these two waves, the Y polarization and the X polarization will be expressible in the phasor wall as such. And plus the phase difference between them, okay? And then in the phasor wall, if you were to write out what LHEP is, you'll put the pi over two there, and then your phasor will look something like E to the beta z, all of them propagate with the same uh, phase function, but then the x and the y component would have different phases. Okay, and then you can do the same thing for RHEP. So in the phasor world, pictures are quite different, except that you have to learn how to go back and forth between frequency domain and time domain in this course. Okay, this would be just that. Okay. And then you can work out the instantaneous power flow too. And we learned this in lecture five, lecture note five. Okay. So in that case, you will take this E instantaneously as a function of time crossing with H instantaneously as a function of time. And that we actually have worked out uh, before, okay? This was in the x direction, and then you will find that h will be in the y direction, and then 
what you have is that um, this is worked out in the lecture notes, okay? Cosine square uh, omega t minus beta c. So what I want you to notice is that um, this thing is not constant of time, not constant of time and space. Okay. However, if you were to have a circularly polarized wave, a CP, you have a CP, you can go to the algebra, you can find the complex power, okay, the complex power, or the even not, not the complex power, the instantaneous power, E T cross H T. And if it is a CP, then you find that the power formula is quite different. It's just a constant, independent of space and time. So that's the peculiarity about CP, okay? And then we have pictures of that. Uh, and then you can see that uh, animation of this thing moving through space. Okay, are there any questions before we, we quit? for this lecture. So I, I don't have time to work out some of the details, but you can read the lecture, you will see that uh, for circular polarization, the instantaneous power is always independent of time. Whereas for linear polarization, uh, they are dependent on time. Okay, any questions? If not, then I just let you go then. Okay, thank you for coming. I, I can still hold an office hour at three o'clock this afternoon if you have any questions. Okay, bye bye then. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Okay, bye bye. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.